A quick review of chemical bonding for organic chemistry. Bonding can be covalent or ionic. And whether you get a covalent or an ionic bond depends on the types of atoms involved in the bond. If you have a nonmetal bonding with a nonmetal, both of these atoms have high electronegativity, meaning neither one wants to give up its electrons. So what they can do is they can share electrons. There's a small difference in electronegativity, right? So a low delta E n, which means we get electron sharing. And one shared pair of electrons constitutes a covalent bond. For ionic bond, however, we typically have a metal with a nonmetal. And the metal has a low electronegativity. The nonmetal has a high electronegativity. That means the metal will lose an electron. That electron will go to the nonmetal. And so you end up with a metal cation and a nonmetal anion. And then the attractive force between the positively charged cation and the negatively charged anion constitutes the ionic bond. And then, of course, this isn't really uh, a binary thing. There actually is a whole range. In the middle, we have what's called polar covalent bonds, where the more electronegative atom gets more of the electron density. Remember Coulomb's law? Coulomb's law tells you about the potential energy between two charged particles, particle 1 and particle 2. So, K is a constant, Q1 is the charge on particle 1, Q2 is the charge on particle 2, and R is the distance between them. If Q1 has a positive uh, sign and Q2 has a negative sign, then you end up with a negative potential energy. So this means that the closer together a positively charged particle is with a negatively charged particle, the lower the energy, and that constitutes an attractive force. Let's consider a pair of atoms now. The positively charged particle at the center is the nucleus, and it's orbited by electrons. So we've got two atoms here. And of course, a nucleus is attracted to its own electrons, but it's also attracted to the electron in the other atom. So the nucleus of the atom on the left is attracted to the electron of the atom on the right. And the nucleus of the atom on the right is attracted to the electron of the atom on the left. This graph shows what happens when you take two hydrogen atoms and you start bringing them closer and closer together to get a hydrogen molecule. On the far right, we're at effectively infinite distance where the two hydrogen atoms are not attracted to each other, and hence, their energy is zero via Coulomb's law. As you bring them closer and closer together, electron nuclear attraction starts to lower the energy. And that attraction grows and grows and grows and grows as you bring the nucleus of one atom closer to the electron of the other. But then look what happens here the potential energy starts rocketing up if you get the nuclei too close. That rapid increase is because of internuclear repulsion. In other words, the positive charge of the nucleus on the atom on the left is repelling the positive charge of the nucleus on the atom on the right, and that becomes important as they get too close together. So, the ideal distance where the attractive force is maximized and the repulsive force is not that important is 0.74 angstroms. That doesn't mean that H2 molecules spend all their time with the nuclei 0.74 angstroms apart because uh, molecules are dynamic and what it's actually doing is oscillating. That bond is stretching. It's vibrating. And the higher the thermal energy, 
the higher the oscillations, the greater the stretch. If you heat a molecule up enough, then you can actually overcome the attractive force and cause the molecule to dissociate. That's called thermal dissociation. Nonetheless, that 0.74 angstrom value, that is the average bond length for an HH bond. Now, not all covalent bonds are created equal. An HH bond is very short because the two atomic orbitals that go into creating it are 1s orbitals with uh, small atomic radii. So you've got a 0.74 angstrom bond length and hence a very strong bond. Shorter bonds are stronger at 436 kilojoules per mole. A carbon-carbon single bond, this is at n equals 2, right? Because carbons have their highest energy electrons in 2p orbitals. Hence, the bond length is more than double. It's 1.54 angstroms, and the strength is significantly lower at 347 kilojoules per mole. Bottom line, the longer a bond is, the weaker it is. Now consider a CC double bond. This double dash means two shared pairs of electrons. Now the length is shorter at 1.34 angstroms, and the bond is stronger at 611 kilojoules per mole. It's not twice as strong, though. That's because a single bond is a sigma bond, a double bond is a sigma bond and a pi bond, and a sigma bond is stronger than a pi bond. In fact, the CC bond is sigma, the CC double bond is sigma plus pi, so the 347 kilojoules per mole is sigma, and 611 is sigma plus pi. That means the strength of a pi bond is 611 minus the sigma, or 611 minus 347. So that carbon-carbon pi bond is worth 264 kilojoules per mole. But not all double bonds are created equal either. For instance, a CO double bond is shorter than a CC double bond at 1.23 angstroms, and it's stronger. It has 736 kilojoules per mole. Again, we see the trend that a shorter bond is stronger. Also, a double bond is stronger than a single bond. For a triple bond, since it's three shared pairs of electrons, we should predict that it is shorter than the carbon-carbon double bond and also stronger. And indeed, when we Google it, we see that it, uh, on average, a CC triple bond has a length of 1.20 angstroms, so it's shorter than a CC double bond. And it also has a strength of 837 kilojoules per mole. Now, bear in mind these are average bond lengths and bond strengths.